Hello everyone and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. An aircraft carrier flight deck is one of the most exhilarating and stringent operating environments in the world. From launching and recovering high-speed jets to storing and maintaining ordnance and other vehicles on board, these military vessels play a pivotal role at sea. In today's features, let's explore the operational processes of not just aircraft carriers, but also other military ships that perform similar specialized roles. The flight deck operations on an aircraft carrier are meticulously executed for the safety of personnel and equipment on board. With so much going on at once, foreign object damage, or FOD, is a major concern that requires constant vigilance. This starts with frequent FOD walks. It involves all available personnel scouring the flight deck or tarmac for any loose materials that might be sucked into a jet's engine. A few minutes prior to launch, the aircraft is taxied from its parking position and attached to the catapult system on the deck. As the tow bar of the aircraft is attached to the slot of the catapult, a 12-foot tall portion of the flight deck is raised to stand not less than 50 feet from the tail of the aircraft. These panels are operated using hydraulic arms and are equipped with active cooling systems powerful enough to deflect the 1,300 degrees Celsius temperatures of modern jet afterburners. The jet blast deflector deflects the high energy exhaust from a departing jet plane, preventing damage and injury on the personnel and other aircraft around. Over the years, steam-powered catapults have been deemed expensive, difficult to maintain, and limited by operational capabilities for the modern aircraft carriers. This has paved the way for Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch Systems, or EMALs. The EMALs comprises a linear induction motor, which uses electric currents to generate magnetic fields that propel a carriage along a track to launch the aircraft. Electric power from the carrier's electrical distribution system is supplied to energy storage systems that in turn generate magnetic fields, which accelerates the aircraft more smoothly, causing less stress to the airframes. An aircraft carrier can accommodate as many as 3,600 personnel on board who are all responsible for specific duties. These personnel can be identified with the color of their jackets. For instance, the green jackets are worn by the catapult and arresting gear crew, while the red jackets are ordnance handlers as well as dealing with all crash and salvage situations on board. Those in purple jackets are responsible for fueling the aircrafts. Whereas the yellow jackets are aircraft handling officers, responsible for the movement of aircraft on the flight deck, as well as in the hangar bay. Also known as the carrier's garage, the hangar bay is usually located two decks below the flight deck and is more than two-thirds the length of the entire ship. It can secure more than 60 aircraft in four zones, divided by sliding doors. Giant elevators help move the aircraft between the hangar and the flight deck.
The design of an aircraft carrier is quite distinctive compared to other sea vessels. However, the amphibious assault ships that operate as a part of the modern Navy closely resemble the aircraft carrier. The flight decks of these ships are used mostly to operate attack and utility helicopters and short takeoff and vertical landing capable aircrafts like the F-35B, the Harrier, and other fixed wing aircrafts. The largest fleet of amphibious assault ships is currently operated by the U.S. Navy and includes eight WASP-class ships. They are also designed with an internal well deck, which is a large open area designed to be flooded during amphibious operations to launch and recover landing craft and other amphibious vehicles. Located in the lower aftmost section of the ship, the well deck can be flooded to lower its stern, allowing amphibious vehicles and landing craft to dock within the ship. The process of embarking an amphibious assault vehicle, or AAV, aboard an amphibious ship can be dangerous. So predefined rules and procedures must be followed during the disembarkation, as well as embarkation of the AAV. During disembarkation, the vehicles must maintain an interval of 165 to 245 feet between each deployment. A green flag or a green light is used as a signal for the AAVs to move ahead. While embarking the ship, the approach must be made from directly astern in water jets mode. The AAV driver receives guidance via hand signals from the petty officer in charge. Once in solid contact with the deck, the driver is ground guided to pivot the vehicle 180 degrees into its parking space. To prevent confusion and mishaps, personnel remain aboard the AAV until it is completely parked and secured. Another vehicle that operates from the well deck of an amphibious assault ship is the Landing Craft Air Cushion, or LCAC, used primarily by the U.S. Marine Corps to transport troops, military vehicles, and other equipment from amphibious ships to areas of combat operations. These over-the-beach, fully amphibious landing crafts are capable of carrying a 60 to 75 ton payload and travel at a speed of over 40 knots. However, in 2014, the ultra heavy lift amphibious connector was introduced to augment and replace the LCAC fleet. It was programmed to bring ashore more troops and equipment. and can even land multiple tanks at once. The massive 42 feet long, 26 feet wide, and 17 feet high UHAC was at the time only half the size of the expected final version. Unlike the LCAC, the UHAC can continue moving while onshore across mudflats, tidal marsh areas, and even over seawalls of up to 10 feet in height the UHAC will be able to carry payloads of up to 190 tons, almost three times as much as the LCAC. Therefore, when the UHAC does come into full use, it will be a worthy replacement indeed for the LCAC fleet.
that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.